So, in this special lesson I'm preparing for the folks at iFiddle Magazine, I'm going to talk about what I did in a little promo jam there. Um, first thing I did was jam with the A blues scale. Now, I know Mike has asked me to do a tune, but my thing is all about the jam, and I'm sure there's plenty of places you can learn an actual tune. I want to show you some of the tricks of my trade. Maybe they interest you. Um, First was the A blues scale. Now the A blues scale has a very unique um, finger pattern on the violin when it's tuned in the standard tuning. That it has what I call two different easy zones. Now the easy zones are featured in the Fiddle Jam book. Again, uh, just to show you copies of this stuff, there's the Fiddle Jam book. Um, and on the Fiddle Jam Institute website, um, where you can go beyond the book. Anyways, uh, that's part of the Fiddle Jam method where we focus on these easy fingering boxed sets that are the same on two strings or next to each other. Symmetrical fingering on two adjacent strings. Um, the reason I focus on this for beginning improvisation with people is not to dumb it down because I think you're too stupid to get it, but because us humans tend to think too much about things and when it comes to things, creative things like music, we uh, our thinking kind of dulls down the emotive part of music, which is the main event in my opinion, where music is supposed to be for giving and getting goosebumps, primarily. And when we think too hard about stuff, especially like instant creativity like improvisation, the less we think about it, the better we sound. So if we can take these simple, at first, take these simple fingerings, and they're kind of no-brainers right off, to, right, right off to, from the get-go, um, it makes it a lot easier to get into those thinking, non-thinking states and sound better and give and get goosebumps. Simple as that. So, more effective. So, what are those two easy zones? In the key of A, A blues. Um, on the top two strings, it's open, low two, three, and the next string, same thing. Officially, that's called a minor pentatonic scale for those of you who are uh, theory inclined. I like to call theory music mechanics, by the way. It's a little less, less scary. But anyways, um, so try that on your own. Low two, three, open, low two, three. Now you notice I didn't say the letter names or anything. This is for fiddlers too. If you don't know the names of the notes and you only know fiddlers tab, what fingers, there you go. If you are a violinist who knows the names of the notes, it's A, C, D, E, G, A. Five different letters with two A's. A, C, D, E, G. Now I just made up some stuff. Sounded pretty easy. Sounded kind of cool, I hope, to you. Sounds kind of cool to me and most people I teach. So, now officially, 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 um, the minor pentatonic scale turns into a blues scale, according to many uh, scholars and stuff, when you add the flatted fifth of the key. In the key of A, A, B, C, D, E, E is the fifth note, and the flatted fifth would be E flat. So that is the lowered fourth finger on the A string in this case. It's got a nasty note, uh, sound note, you got to curl up your lip to play. So you just heard me try a few licks there. Famous riff and lick uh, trick would be going from the E flat, sliding into it, and then opening. Sounds cool, doesn't it? Violinists have a long ways to go as far as this kind of stuff in developing our history um, for into the next you know phase, which I think has just started about 15 years ago. In phase two, we're gonna I'm gonna call it. Um, with the alternative string movement that started. Um, but um, we are definitely in the catch-up mode yet compared to guitarists and uh, horn players who are about a hundred years ahead of us as far as applying blues scales and this kind of stuff to alternative um, styles like jazz and this kind of stuff. Um, so that riff there is definitely taken from guitar players like Chuck Berry and that kind of stuff in the 1950s. So look to those other, other musicians, other instruments to find your own vocabulary riffs. I'll teach you a few here today. Another one would be going backwards on the top three notes. 
it's easy to do fast. It's kind of a, a cheap shot, but that's okay. I try not to do too many cheap shots, you know, like pre-planned, pre-canned licks when I improvise. I try to be directly tapped into the muses and only playing what they tell me kind of thing. That's the goal. But um, it's okay to have a few tricks up your sleeve to grab people's attention because if you only play heartfelt, some people will get it and some won't tune into your heartfelt stuff until they, whoa, this person's good, and they have a little bit of flash. I leave about 10% room for flash as a formula. you got to grab people's attention and sell yourself, so that's okay. One of those tricks can be just peel your fingers away. All right? Now, the A, C, D, E, G can continue anywhere in the violin. Here's A, C, D, E, G. Go anywhere you want. Oftentimes I'll do, I'll reach up to the C just beyond the fourth finger B to slide up. And sliding is a cool thing in these bluesy things. You can slide, you don't have to nail the intonation right on the, on the mark like you do in classical music. You can, and we already talked about sliding that E flip. Now if you're, if you're watching my fingers and are quick and can see in the video, I just slid the second position. I did the first finger on the C, second finger on the D, that made me do a lowered third finger on the E flat. There's another riff for you. You can combine them all. There you go, even further. C, D, E flat with the third finger, open E, low, what was low two with first finger, A with the second finger, and the C that we talked about with the pinky. Or backwards. I might have done that riff in the in the little promo video. So, now that might, all, <laughs> it might seem fast to you if you're just kind of a beginner, but go slow and do it your way and your speed. Control it and do it like you're hearing it inside your head, like the angels are sending you the ideas to play exactly at the right times. So that's always the goal. Now, we mentioned that... Uh, the, the scale was A, C, D, E, G, anywhere on the violin. So, there happens to be in the key of A, a second easy zone. This is one of the only scales that fits on the violin this way. And the other one is even easier, I think. Um, it's on the bottom two strings. Here's an A, first finger, then the C, third finger. G is also part of that A, C, D, E, G. So we got open, one, three. And the next string, same fingering, open, one, three. So that's A, C, D, E, G, with a double G to sound. So it's unlike practicing scales in the class where we start in the tonic and go up to the tonic and come back down. This is improvisation, so you can start the fingering anywhere you want in the scale. It just happens to be a no-brainer, an easy one. So to review, on the bottom two strings, open one, three, is all A blues, and on the top two strings, open low two, three, is all the same exact five notes again too. And the five note thing is called a pentatonic scale for those who are not real familiar with that kind of music mechanics. So what can you do with this stuff? The best way I had to teach it often is by call and answer. So maybe I can put a drum beat on and we can try that. Before I do that though, let's, let's talk about that blue note, that E flat that was in the e, A string. There's another E flat here, of course. You have to blow that. It'd be the lowered first finger on the D string. So you can get some cool stuff there. In the Fiddle Jam book, uh, I show finger charts with uh, you know a box around uh, these easy zones. In this key, there's two of them. Um, and I say, stay within the box. Stay safe at first. You know, Start on an A, and the A's have stars around them. So you can kind of aim for those. Start your, your ideas on an A, end on an A, come back to A the most, and use any of the notes in the box and you'll be golden. You can't hardly sound bad. All right, that's, that's the basic formula for improvisation. At least in the Fiddle Jam book, and most things, uh, not most things, many things in, in, in the real world, musical world, you can get away, with, get away with just one scale fits all. And I've definitely uh, made sure that all the uh, tracks to play along with in the book and in what we call level one on the website, um, are that, that you can just go nuts with one scale. And that's great experience. You can have a whole career doing that. Matter of fact, when I played with Gamelon, 
we were just really good at being a one chord jam band, pretty much. We went all the way to playing the Newport Jazz Festival, open up for Miles Davis and other other famous people, and we were just very exciting at that. We would start the solos quiet and build it up to a frenzy. The bass would real funky stuff, and the chords would swim over the top of it, and the solos would just go crazy with one scale, pretty much, and just. Res- respond to the music dynamically. That was our thing. Climax music, we called it. Uh, go crazy and drive everybody in the audience nuts and then psh, the next guy gets a chance. So you can have a career just doing only this level one stuff. In the real world, not always does it fit this tidily. Um, you know, songs and composers can write whatever they feel sounds good to them. And not always does the same scale always, always fit everything. Um, and it'll take further study to know a few of those things. Level two of this kind of approach is when you learn simple one four five chords and learn a major pentatonic scale that fits each chord and switch on when the of the three chords the one four and five if you know that stuff you do the major pentatonic of the one chord the major pentatonic of the four chord major pentatonic of the five chord that's level two but right now we're going to just focus on level one and we're going to learn to jam today with some a blues riffs i'm going to put on a beat wake my computer up here um, hopefully this will sound balanced. I'll put on a beat, a little shuffle beat from a blues tune, and uh, I'll play something for measure. You try playing it back. All right, simple as that. I'm going to start very simple. I'm going to start on an A. This is the key of A. So just follow along the best you can and try at home. There we go. Buffalo shuffle. One, two, three, four. that go so far so good now if you don't get it exactly like me don't worry about it this is I'm training you for improvisation and you can just use this as a call and answer and your answer doesn't have to be the same it can be your own creation if you want just counter something with me if you want to train your ear try and do exactly what I did if you want to just do your own thing that's totally cool too remember improvisation the bottom line is to do what you think sounds good not what I think sounds good always what you think sounds good be a completely obedient to that inner voice be relaxed enough and know what you're doing enough so you don't have to think too hard about it like we started out in this video. And uh, so you can tune in then to that voice. My goal is always to have my flailing factor, as we call it in Bobby, down low. I'm just crazy doing crazy riffs. And uh, you're, you know, getting divine ideas from above, wherever they come from, uh, as the number one priority. No, just be 100% tuned in, only playing the things you've pre-heard in your head a split second before. That's always the goal, and it's always the most effective as far as reaching out to the audience. So, and that takes a little ear training, a little bit of experience of tuning into that. I'll talk quickly about uh, another concept I I teach on the site, and that, uh, before we go on to the lower octaves, uh, that us humans really hear in three different time zones at once. We hear in this kind of holographic nature in our brain. You may notice this. We hear, of course, what we hear when we hear it with our physical ears. You're hearing me speak right now as you listen to the video. And, but also, inside our heads bounces around what we just heard for a second. Just a second, just a second. Just like in the movies, that kind of echoes around in there. We can still kind of recall it and hear what we just heard. That's important. But more importantly for an improviser is what we expect to hear in the near future. So that's where improvisers' minds lie when they're really good or even called great. You are tapped into greatness when you can do that consistently. 
Um, so all the time you're just trying to take what you're hearing, and say the band is playing underneath you, you take what's given and know this, the key and you kind of hear in your head a split second ahead what you'd like to play and just bring it into reality in the moment. So we're constantly bringing things from the future into the reality. That is the measure of greatness as an improviser or performer or even a speaker. You'll hear uh, preachers do that or, or politicians when they speak. I'm telling you, they'll place each word just for emphasis, right exactly on some kind of imaginary timeline that they're feeling inside themselves and hearing in their head ahead of time. When you're relaxed like that and not thinking so hard about the physical stuff and what note am I playing next, it'll start to come. And if this is completely a new thing to you, uh, it just takes a little practice. And it takes more of a mental practice than physical practice even, but you can get used to it. It may take many years for you to develop and get really consistent with it. Um, it did me. Um, you know, I, I played a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot as a teen and into my 20s. And it took me a while to get the, the concept as really consistent. Now I, I feel that the, the bar has raised for me every, every performance. I am less distracted by whatever you can be distracted about, whether it's, uh, gee, I wonder what that person's thinking. Oh, it's all over. Or, oh, my mother's here. i got to do good now. Or, my friend's here. He hasn't been here in six months. i got to show him my new licks. And it's all over then. You're not connected anymore. It's being the trance state, being the zone. Still be happy and be an entertainer, but constantly listening to the future and just playing that. That's the goal. It might be a high goal, but uh, if you know the goal, you can get to the goal faster. Makes sense, right? If you don't know the goal, you wander around aimlessly and just be playing mindless riffs and nobody will care. So, but I find that when um, you do tap in like that, people listen harder. There's some magic to it. I had one, one uh, bandmate one time, not to just toot my own horn, but I'll tell you this quick story. We were playing in a bar and he goes, you know, we're a good band, he said, but as soon as Jeff Perry plays, all heads turn. He said, I don't get it. So it's not because I'm magically gifted and talented or have some psychic ability or anything like that. It's simply that. I think more so than the rest of the band in that case, I was just better at playing only what I hear in my head. And that somehow reaches out to people and they get in sync with you uh, and they, there's this coherence that happens between us. Maybe even energetically there's some science, uh, scientific people are kind of proving that kind of, that kind of thing happens. So, um, and that's nothing new. Willie Nelson knows all about that. He says in his book, The Tao of Willie, that, uh, that his magic for each gig, even if it's a crappy gig and he wishes he wasn't there and not feeling good, he kind of connects with one person down the front row and smiles at them. They smile back and it starts this thing and it spreads throughout the whole audience and every gig come, turns out pretty much to be magical because of that one technique he has. He's like a spiritual master, that guy. He, whether you like him or not, he's pretty, that's somebody I look up to, as I stated in the interview. All right. Anyways, back to that lower octave of A blues. Lower octave of A blues, open one three. Remember the A is not the open, A is the first finger. So let's put on the beat again and try a few calls and answers with just that zone, that easy zone. Again, I'll start on the A. That's my Buffalo Shuffle beat. I'll call it to my hometown. Ready? A one, two, three, knee. quite catch that last trip, that's okay, you can do your own thing. But anyways, I hope you're having fun with that. The other thing I'd like to talk about quickly is the thing I did at the end of the promo demo um, with chopping. Chopping is a new technique um, for the violin world. It consists of uh, creatively and percussively scratching. 
down by the frog, down by the part where you hardly ever play, way down there underneath your fingers of your hand. Now it was invented supposedly historically uh, by Richard Green who was playing with Bill Monroe Band who was being punished by Bill Monroe for having bad time, he said. He, he told us the story at one of the ASTA conferences I was a speaker at. And uh, Bill Monroe was a tough boss and told him to just keep time. One, two, three, four, until further notice. So he said, I'm standing there kind of like a jerk, feeling like a dodo brain on, on stage, just doing this for the whole concert. And after a while, he said, I got tired. Okay, whatever, one. And he started doing this little scratch, and the band said, hey, that sounds kind of cool, because as you know, in bluegrass music, there's no drums. So he was kind of being like a snare drum in a way, wasn't he? So that's, this is Richard Green telling us this story himself, the man who supposedly is the father of the chop. And he developed it more, and uh, is credited with being the first guy to record it, that kind of thing. And then later years in the 80s, I think it was Daryl Anger, the great uh, jazz, uh, fiddler, uh, a freestyle fiddler, I think he calls himself, um, and uh, he said, hey, I want to learn that. So he kind of learned it from Richard Green and took it to the Turtle Island String Quartet, you know, camps and stuff, and kind of grew from there. They taught the younger generation how to do it. So I learned from those guys, and um, it's simply that. So the best way to start is by plopping your fingers over the strings so they make no notes. You don't want that first. And try it on the top two strings. Just, and it's best if you have a classical technique and have some flexibility to your fingers. That really helps the chop. There's no exact right or wrong way to do it, but if you stiffen your fingers, it's just a lot more cumbersome. It becomes the whole arm. So if you have a good classical technique, it helps. Uh, like Richard Green himself said, there's no, why should you buck 400 years of development of the violin? Why should you set your bridge up different? Just let the violin sound good and play it. So, and the same thing with our techniques. They've developed over these hundreds of years for reasons, and one of them is flexibility in all the joints. So if you don't have that, start practicing this. See if you can move the bow, you know, Leave the tip, you know, a good inch or inch and a half just by flexing only the fingers. You can hold your hand. So if you're classically trained, you probably already know this pretty well. Never stiffen anything is my thing, is my goal. Violin's weird enough to hang on to without having to go to the chiropractor too often. So, chopping. You lift the fingers up and just drop them. Notice it's not a lot of the back of the hand, it's that kind of thing. Right on the string. Don't. It's not a spiccato, it's not bouncing off, it's just stuck, stuck to the string. It has a little bit of pushing out motion. If anything, it's probably coming down at a 45 degree angle a little bit. So it's a scratch and a stuck if you had to do it slow motion and... and uh... Now you notice I didn't have my hands on the strings there and there's a little upstroke and you pick it up. That's cool too, I use that as well. can be part of the style too, you can develop your own thing. So what you're really becoming here is a drummer, a beatboxer. You know, I'm not good at beatboxing, I have a friend who's very good at it. Um, it's amazing, As a matter of fact, we're going to do a project together next, I think, a DJ. DJ and violin, what do you think? And we'll, uh, and where's my album again? We'll be promoting this record, which is more electronic with fiddle on the top. I, I've incorporated a DJ into it into the mix. We're going to be working with him. We're trying to develop it. Anyways, watch for that. Um, back to the chop. So often I will do a little more, sometimes spiccato, if I want the notes to ring. Right now I'm jamming in the key of A, so I got the root and the fifth. So A and E, and down here an A and an E. And my finger kind of barred across both strings at the same time. So you nestle it between the strings, the finger pad. I don't know if you can see that. Let's see here right between, not favoring one string or the other, right nestle it equally between. This should be fairly well in tune for what guitar players call the, par the not only parallel fifth, but the power chord. So, um, so sometimes I'll go, actually have a note, sometimes I'll just chop that. So on the bottom strings is a thicker sound, the top strings is a sharper sound. Just like a drummer has different drums, different cymbals and stuff, you're trying to emulate that, different sounds. So, try that. So it's spiccato on the, on the A at the bottom, and then I did a chop with an upstroke that hears a few notes. So try that. I'm giving a bass note. So you're trying to be the whole band here, really. It's like this is the bass, here's the snare drum, and here's some uh, guitar. <laughs> so I did 
double there. Then I chopped in the top strings. See. So I did a subtle stop. Try that. Double chop on the bottom two strings, a little lift, and then a big chop on the top two strings. Now it's just a little set down. None of them have to be loud and, and crashing. And notice I plop my fingers down to help different sounds too. Sometimes you on the ring, sometimes make the knot. This is a guitar playing technique. Guitar players do it all the time. They'll lay their They'll mute strings with their left hand fingers sometimes, and we can steal from them as well. If you can accomplish this, you're on your way. So, what am I doing? Double, little set down, and then I place my fingers. So, there was a dead fingers. A double there at the end. So, practice that and you'll be on your way. Now, by the way, I should mention that Tracy Silverman hit me to this. He does a lot of chopping. He's quite the master at it. And uh, he said, think about it, Jeff. He said, when you hold your fiddle down low, which he does, and I used to when I played Cajun music, um, and he said, a full-size bow is too long. You never use the top foot of it, so it's as long as your arm is. I was playing in Zydeco groups at the time, Lee Ron Zydeco and the Hot Tamales. did about four albums with them. And I said, well, of course, it makes complete sense. And he said, and on top of that, the bows are super cheap, <laughs> and um, so cheap that I don't have to get a rehair. When I need a rehair, I just throw the bow and get another one. But... Um, so that's one advantage for the financially uh, challenged, and as most musicians are. And uh, also, they're more agile because there's less weight waving around in the air. So it, it, a short bow it helps with the chopping, too. And you just got, don't have long of a stroke. So if you want to try a kid's, this is a half size. I know Tracy uses a quarter size bow. I settled into a half size bow. Uh, I just found a decent octagonal bow that was, you know, I liked and uh, used those. So that's a couple tricks of the trade, all right? So jamming with the, with the easy zones and a little chopping, and you're on your way to being a modern uh, jamming master. So I hope this has helped you, and uh, this is a cool thing to be, I'm a, an honored to be part of iFiddle Magazine that Mike Spears has asked me. And uh, again, check out my stuff. Uh, come be a part of the uh, Fiddle Jam Institute if you're so inclined. I teach this and much more, many different styles, and uh, it's all about the jamming and it's at the levels that I mentioned, different levels of theoretical knowledge and music mechanics, as we call it. We're starting to run different courses that are intended to last about four weeks each. Uh, we're going through some updates here in August, and uh, we'll be launching some more of those in the fall and September. So watch that, the fiddlejaminstitute.com. And uh, check out my stuff on iTunes and elsewhere, YouTube, and hope you enjoy I've, as I've enjoyed teaching you. So, see you around, man. And girls.